Hello, Alex here, and today we're going to talk about some recent Canon news and give a little personal update. Let's get right into it. I haven't rehearsed this video like I normally would rehearse parts of most of my others because I don't have time. I have a full-time job and I want to get this video out today, so let's just roll with it. It's going to be messy, but it's going to get the information out there, so yeah. So the big Canon news that everyone is talking about today, the EOS R3 development announcement. Canon have announced development of the EOS R3 mirrorless full-frame camera. This will be instantly recognizable to anyone familiar with the 1D line or even, you know, the flagship lines of other brands like Nikon's DN series, if you want to call it that, single digit line. Like you see the integrated battery grip and that's a clear sign that this is a professional grade tool. It's not a consumer or even prosumer camera. This is for the tip top pros who don't want to have to spend extra money for a vertical grip. It's like if you're including the grip, you incorporate it into the design of the camera so you can avoid that wasted space at the interface, you know, where you have to have ceiling on the bottom of the camera, the top of the grip. No, it's just all one thing. You can put a bigger battery and you can use more and bigger and faster memory cards because you have room for more processing power. You have better heat dissipation because the camera itself is larger. And that's all good. This is a clear sign of the direction that they're going in. This is being marketed as a sports camera. And I think that's what we expected from the flagship mirrorless. Well, one of them, we'll get back to that. It's, it's a flagship sports camera. It's probably going to be released in time for the Tokyo Olympics, which have been delayed from 2020 to 2021. Okay, so we know basically nothing about this camera. So let's just talk about what we actually do know. First things obvious in the product image, integrated battery grip. We can see it uses a similar shape of battery to the 1D cameras. So it's probably going to be either an LPE19 battery like this 1D uses or an LPE20, maybe if it supports USB power delivery, which it should. Canon have also said it's their first camera incorporating a full frame backside illuminated or BSI CMOS sensor. All you have to know about that is that it means good low light performance. It doesn't really mean anything to most people beyond that. Uh, including me, it's fine. Yeah, it's good low light performance. That's all we need. Yeah, just make the camera better. And it is going to be better. It's a new good sensor. That's exactly what this kind of flagship camera should bring with it, you know, advanced new technology that can really push the limits. Speaking of pushing the limits, this thing will shoot, yep, yeah, 30 frames per second with full auto exposure and autofocus tracking. That is batshit crazy. There are some cameras that can shoot 30 frames per second in electronic shutter, but some of them like the, the Fuji X-T3 do so with an extra 1.25 times crop in addition to the APS-C crop. And that's to help with the readout speed across the sensor. So the readout speed of this sensor must be incredibly fast to be able to handle that. Two things which are obvious really, uh, it's going to use the RF mount because Canon don't seem to be making any more EF mount cameras, which is fair and it will be heavily, heavily weather sealed, which is exactly what you expect. The sensor will include the next generation Canon dual pixel autofocus system, which promises to deliver superior performance, tracking the head and faces of your subjects, even when shooting at 30 frames per second, which is absolutely insane. The last killer feature for this camera is its eye controlled autofocus system or ECAF. Canon had this decades ago in the EOS 3 and EOS 5, and they had that really cool feature where you could choose your autofocus point just by looking at it, and that's really cool. I've never tried it out. But it's obviously going to be a lot better in the modern camera. It's got a lot more processing power to push this kind of thing, and the idea of just holding your AF on button, don't even need to change tracking mode. You know, if this thing is customizable like the 1D series, you can set AF on, and then a different AF on using the AE lock button. Like if you're shooting sports, you don't have to focus and recompose or stop and restart autofocus to choose, you know, between which basketball you're focusing on. You just look at the other player and you're there. That's amazing. I think that's really cool. Okay, so that's pretty much all we know. Um, so I wanna talk about some things that I think are likely and unlikely with this camera. So I think it's almost a given pretty much that we're gonna have in-body image stabilization, IBIS, dual CF Express memory slots to keep up with that crazy burst rate. I don't see it being CF Express and SD by any stretch. Even UHS-2 is nowhere near enough. 
I think we'll see two of those smart controllers, the little like touchpad thing that you have on the back of the 1DX Mark III because it's amazing. And um, I use that for one of my two AF on systems. The actual smart controller is AF on and I can just slide over it to choose my focus point. I don't use the joystick except in the menus because why would I? And then just hold the other button and it starts tracking. It's perfect. And I think that makes sense to include in their new 1D shaped mirrorless camera. It's, it, I, I would be very surprised if they didn't include it. You know, maybe when the inevitable R1 comes out, which I think will be like a 50 megapixel monster directly competing with the Sony Alpha one, unless they're gonna deliberately nerf a pro-grade camera like that, which I doubt. The days of the Canon cripple hammer seem to be long gone, so fingers crossed they have some sense there. So there are some things that I'd like to see as well, but I'm not really convinced that we're actually gonna see them. Um, 8K recording, I think is somewhat safe. You know, if we could get 8K 30 grand, but with, you know, the bigger body, better heat dissipation. But 8K means you need like, what, 32, 33 megapixels at minimum. So I think we'll see something in the like 34 to 36 megapixel kind of range. And that leaves room for an R1 that can be the 50, 60 megapixel stupid fast camera that's also stupid high res. I also mentioned this before, USB power delivery. I think that would be amazing. Um, I love transferring files off this directly using the USB-C port, and I don't see why they wouldn't upgrade it. It's a 3.2 gen 2x2 whatever. I think that's what it is. USB-C has gone out the window. Just So we don't know when this camera is coming out, but I would wager, yeah, Tokyo Olympics, at the very least, they should have at, in the hands of the sports photographers at the Tokyo Olympics, you know, maybe at least their own brand ambassadors, if not every Canon shooter there. Because in my opinion, they really need to get it out there, get people noticing and using it, make people aware of it, you know, that the Olympics is a big marketing strategy for all of the flagship cameras, and it would be a missed opportunity if they miss out on that. It wouldn't be great. Okay, now we're going to talk about the three new RF mount lenses that were announced today. Two, nice, expected, whatever, but the third is really spicy and I really like it. So first we have the 600mm f4 RF lens. It's a huge chonkin' boy. I checked the price on my local camera shop earlier and I think it's over 15,000 euros, which I expected. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be heavy, but probably lighter than the old model. It's going to be sharper. It's going to have faster autofocus. It's going to be everything you could possibly want in a 600mm f4 lens. There's nothing really more to say about that. Same for the 400mm f2.8. That's your big, like, soccer, maybe baseball lens. I don't know what baseball photographers use, but soccer, yeah, 400 2.8. That's it. So having a newer model with, you know, more, I don't know, native or direct integration with the modern camera systems and maybe even just more focus motors so it can focus faster would be great. They're both going to be amazing. I don't really think they're worth talking about quite that much. The real spicy boy is the RF 100mm macro lens. So I have the EF 100mm f2.8 L macro lens. And this thing is very nice. It's very sharp. I do all my film scanning with it. I do a bit of macro photography with it. And it's a nice solid macro lens. But the new one goes to a whole nother level. It goes to 1.4x life size. That means you get greater than life size reproduction with your subject, which is, which is insane. You know, normally you could only get 1.4x with most macro lenses with either a crazy extension tube set up, uh, using a diopter filter, which on a high-end macro lens is a bad idea. Or if you like slap a teleconverter on the back to turn it into a 140 millimeter macro lens with the same minimum focus distance, you get 1.4x life size reproduction. And this just does it natively. But what's even spicier and what's even nicer about this lens is you have this SA control ring, spherical aberration. And I find it funny that we're coming full circle with spherical aberration. Spherical aberration is a technical thing that I don't want to get into here. It's a an objective flaw in images. It reduces sharpness globally. What this control ring will let you do is manipulate the internal optics in some way that will enable you to control the smoothness of your bokeh, your background blur, likely at the expense of some sharpness in your main image. Sphere collaboration is what makes the Nikon 58mm f1.4 photos look so smooth and creamy, but you can't turn it off. With this lens you can, you can turn it on and off at will, and by the looks of the markings on the ring, you can adjust the strength of the effect, which is really cool. You can have, you know, 
ultra pin sharp photos when you need it for a flower, but if you're using it for a portrait, in which case a 100mm f2.8 isn't exactly, you know, an amazing lens. You know, everyone's looking for 1.4, 1.2 these days. f2.8? Nah. But if you can get f2.8 with a nice long, you know, longish telephoto lens, but get super smooth background and foreground blur, that will outweigh any f1.4 lens with busy bokeh that distracts from your subject or just has really like harsh transitions. So I think that's an amazing addition and that really, and this really sells like what they're doing with the RF mount with a lot of the lenses, they're pushing them beyond a limit. So if you're using, you know, this adapted on an EOS R system camera, that might make you want to switch because you're gaining not just, oh, it focuses a bit quicker, the image stabilization is half a stop better and the MTF charts are a little bit nicer. You gain new features that you don't actually have already. Like, I'm firmly integrated into the EF system now, and that was by choice, but I'm still really excited for what they're doing with the RF mount. Some of this stuff is absolutely amazing, so props to Canon for that. So, my little personal update. This is a very small thing, and it doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't make me an accredited photographer or anything by any means, but I got my Canon Professional Services membership. So I have a little membership card in my wallet now, and it just makes me feel nice and fuzzy that I have all my gear registered, and it's just nice. Lastly, I started a Patreon this morning. I posted a meme about it on my Instagram story yesterday and two people asked me if I actually had one. So I thought, why not make it cheap? I'm going to be doing a lot of technical reviews over the summer where I will be chewing through 120 film. I'm going to be reviewing a lot of that stuff. Hey, I pointed in the right place first try. So I'm going to be using a lot of 120 film and especially color film where I can't just you know throw it in the tank and stand development downstairs or use some DDX. I have to pay you know, a lot of money for the development as well as the film. So look, I'm not going to beg, but if you have money to spare and you want to show your support, you can support me for just one euro a month at the base tier. And that would go a long way to helping pay for the film costs to run some of the more nerdy technical things I want to do on this channel beyond just, I got a lens, it's nice. You know, the really detailed stuff. And I want to do some comparison videos, you know, like film shootouts um, and not all of those film stocks are cheap. So if you could help me out, I would really appreciate it. If you can't, no judgment whatsoever. But in that case, I'd appreciate if you check out one of my next videos, which is coming out in just over two weeks. Thank you very much for your time and have a nice evening. Doodles.